We'll try to continue to keep you updated as well. Uh, hopefully we're shooting for uh, the neck maybe in a few weeks uh, when he's home and sufficiently recovered, bringing him back so that he can, uh, so that he can have his uh, going away reception. But uh, continue to pray for him and hopefully we will be able to bring him back very, very soon. Uh, the next thing, uh, we will have or we will observe the Lord's Supper next week, uh, which is very exciting. It's been a long time, and we're thankful that we have the, the chance to do that again. And then October 4th, uh, we are going to resume Sunday school. We're going to have it in the evening. We have some decisions to make as far as what that's going to look like, and we need to work through some of the logistics. But uh, just kind of keep that in the back of your minds that that's coming, and it's about a month away. So those are our, our announcements. So let's hear God call us to worship then. Uh, as we have gathered together to do. Uh, and our call this morning comes from Psalm 96, verses 7 through 10. I, I, actually, this is, I'll, I'll pause here. This is a good opportunity to explain what that was. That came from, the, the image that's on that first slide, came from the minutes of the first meet, or of the organizational meeting for our church in 1901. Uh, it's from the original record and roll book, as it was called, uh, that goes from about 1901 to about 1914. That's about as long as the records go in that particular one. Uh, and uh, we will talk a little bit more about that later. But for now, let's hear God call us to worship from Psalm 96, verses 7 through 10. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. We've heard God call us to worship, so let's worship him with the words of Psalm 97. Uh, the routine is the same. Uh, the words that are in standard text, uh, I will read, and the words that are underlined that you see on the screen, we'll read those together. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all peoples see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame, those who boast in idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalt exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Let's ask for God's blessing on our worship this morning. Oh Lord our God, you are the one who reigns. All of the so-called gods that we can make, uh, the gods of our own creation, even the gods that we see in the mirror, a pale in comparison. They have eyes but cannot see, mouths but cannot speak, ears but cannot hear, feet but cannot walk. But you, our Lord, are mighty and holy. The Lord is your name. It is you who have made us, you who called us, you who loved us. And because you have made us, you have called us, and you have loved us, we can respond to your call. We can love you. And we ask that our worship this morning would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, that we would do so in spirit and in truth, and that all that we offer might be a fragrant aroma and a sweet-smelling sacrifice to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's continue to worship the Lord with the words of Psalm 15. 
Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent, who may live on your holy mountain, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Amen. Uh, Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Timothy 1. Uh, Our text, uh, as you'll see a little later on, is verses 13 and 14 from this chapter, uh, but we're going to be reading the verses that precede it. All right, 2 Timothy 1, verses 3 to 12, this is the word of the Lord. I thank my God, whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, Let's go to the Lord now and confess our sins. We've heard from his word, we've praised him, uh, but if you spend enough time in the Lord's presence, you realize just how truly sinful we are, even though we have been covered by the blood of Christ. Uh, we still look at our flaws and failures. We see that our, we look too much to the devices of our, own, of our own hearts. And so it is appropriate for us to confess our sins, and let's do so now. O oh Lord our God, merciful Heavenly Father, who dwells in unapproachable light, whose way is in whirlwind and storm, at whose word the mountains tremble and quake. We stand before you knowing that there is nothing in us to turn your heart. But you, O Lord, are good and kind. You are gracious. You have given us your Son, And it is on his merits alone that we approach you to confess our sins. Though you are faithful, we have often been faithless. Though you are merciful, we have not shown mercy to our neighbor. Though you are loving, we have failed in our love for those whom you have called us to love. We have thought too much of our own abilities. We have trusted too much in the designs of our own hearts and minds. We believe ourselves to be sufficient for the task that we have been summoned to. We have made too much of ourselves. For this we ask for forgiveness, knowing that you are a God who is mighty to save, ready to forgive, and that you have promised that those who confess, that when we confess our sins, You are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
We ask that you would do that, that you would renew our minds by the truth of who you are, and that when we are prone to doubt and fear, when we believe ourselves to be the masters of our fates, that you would remind us of who it is that you are, that you are sovereign and good. You ordain all things that come to pass. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you are looking to Jesus Christ alone for your hope of eternal life and your salvation, this word of assurance is for you, and it comes from the passage that we read this morning, actually, 2 Timothy 1, 9, and 10. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. With this word of assurance in our minds, let's praise the Lord one more time uh, through the words of Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being praise this holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He has made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. Amen. Uh, let's go to the Lord now and bring our needs and our petitions to him. O Lord our God, Heavenly Father, you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Indeed, you do not treat us in the way that our sins merit. We deserve nothing but death and hell. But your son, Jesus Christ, has taken the punishment for our sins. For this we are grateful. We are humbled by this gift, knowing that there is nothing in us to merit it, that it only comes through the work of your son. And so we ask, Father, that we would be reminded of this when we are prone to despair and doubt. And we beg you to assure us of your love through the truth of your word. We bring our needs and our petitions to you, Lord God, our daily bread. Please see to them. We ask particularly for Pastor Jerry that you would bring him healing, that you would restore him to health quickly, 
so that we might have the opportunity to show some modicum of appreciation for uh, his decades of faithful labor in your word and among your people. Bless him for his labors. Let them be remembered long, long from now. Please help us as we seek to be faithful with that which we have been given as we navigate a time of transition. Help us to look to you more and more in prayer, to rely more and more on your word, and to entrust ourselves to your good and your fatherly care. I thank you for the ways in which you have preserved us in this time of illness, and we ask that you would continue to do that. Uh, please be with those who are ill, who are struggling, Bring them healing. Give their physicians wisdom so that they might uh, treat them well. Uh, we ask for those who are in darkness this morning. Those who, for whom your presence seems distant and your love seems forgotten. Let them see light, for it is in your light that we are able to see light. Remind them of who you are. Remind them of your goodness and your fatherly care. Remind them of the gift of your son. Remind them of the love that is ours, not because there is anything in us that is lovely, but solely because you are loving. Please see to our needs, Father. We have needs as human, frail, fallible creatures. Some go unmentioned, some we do not speak of, but we pray that you would see to those matters, that your will would be done. We ask uh, for those uh, that we support, our missionaries both here and abroad, uh, please uh, continue to uphold them with your strong and mighty right hand. Help us to be faithful. Uh, not only in giving to support them, but also uh, to pray for them. Let your word go forth in power through their ministry. Turn many from darkness to light. Uh, for us as a congregation, Lord, at times of change and transition, we are all too keenly aware of our need of you. And that it is by your spirit that we might, it is by your spirit alone that we can remain faithful to our calling. And so we ask, spirit, that you would enable us, that you would give us the ability, the power that we need to do this. To live lives of faithful obedience. Let us do this, not for our glory but for your glory, triune God. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The text for our sermon this morning is 2 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14. We read the first part of the chapter in our reading, uh, and now we come to the text. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. This is the word of the Lord. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask for God's blessing on the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, for 120 years nearly, your word has gone forth from this place. We ask that on this day it would do so again, that it would go forth in power. Give me the words to say, help us to listen well to your word. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. We are beneficiaries of events that occurred over a century ago. Some of you probably know this story already. Uh, an evangelist from Philadelphia named E.C. Romine, uh, who was Oriental Trading Company long before it existed, uh, and I'll explain what I mean afterward if you're curious, 
Uh, E.C. Romine preached in July 1900 what was then known as Wycombe Hall, next to the current day public house. And the following month, he and five other area ministers held a series of outdoor evangelistic meetings uh, in the picnic grove that was established by the Cope family. Reverend C.W. Teasdale, uh, who not only preached in those meetings, but was also the pastor of Solberry Baptist, uh, took charge of this fledgling work. And by November, this embryonic congregation had broken ground on what they called a desirable corner lot. Obviously, things looked a little different in those days. Uh, and they began use of their new facilities in February. And on March 10th, 1901, they formal, formally organized as the First Baptist Church of Wycombe, PA. 14 members constituted this new gathering, nine coming by transfer from other area churches, including Teasdale, uh, three by an account of their Christian experience, as they called it, and two by baptism. They formally adopted J. Newton Brown's 1853 Baptist Church Manual, uh, which included a confession of faith, a covenant, a delineation of officers and their duties, and a set of standard procedures. Uh, churches from all over the area were invited to send delegates to recognize, as they called it, the new assembly and to give their assent to the church's new officers. The recognition and dedication services, as they called it, were held the weekend of Sunday, March 22nd. They actually started on Friday afternoon and they kept going through the whole weekend. Uh, and then it was followed by special evening meetings, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday the following week. And thus, with a lot of work and a tiny bit of fanfare, our church was born. Though they never, at least as, I, as far as I can tell, though they never described it this way, what the first members of our church did in adopting Newton's Baptist Church Manual, it's about 40 pages long, uh, was to take steps to ensure that the message that they were coming together to proclaim would remain consistent long into the future. They defined the responsibilities of the church members to one another through the adoption of a covenant. They set out the standard and the form of their teaching in the confession, and they appointed the officers tasked with the responsibility of overseeing the body and defending the faith. In short, what they sought to do was to safeguard the message that they had received and entrusted it to others who would then teach it and train others to do likewise. 120 years later, we are but the latest in a long line of stewards of that message. And we trust that in God's kindness, others will take up that task long after we are gone. This is important to remember in times of transition. We've come to the end of three decades of faithful ministry by Pastor Jerry. Uh, one day, hopefully in the very near future, we will celebrate that accomplishment. It is unusual to have a pastor for that long. It is even more unusual to have only two pastors in a half century. And yet, that is what has happened here. And so that speaks well not only of Pastor Jerry and of Pastor O'Brien, but it also speaks well of you. Uh, nevertheless, for a few of you, this change might be unsettling. Uh, for uh, the man who through, through years of diligent labor in the word earned your trust and shepherded you through times of joy and pain has completed his work and the thought of him to not be here to carefully and faithfully explain God's word is not a pleasant thought to you. Sentiments like these are normal at a time like this. But it's helpful to be reminded that the church universal, uh, God's elect across all of the centuries, has endured transitions that are far, far more traumatic 
than the changes that we are navigating at this moment. There was perhaps no more trying time for the church than the passing of the apostles, as they, by the year 100, had completely, di had completely died off. The men who had walked with Jesus, who had received unique and special authority from him, and some of whom were inspired by the Spirit to write uh, large portions of the New Testament, they were going the way of all men. What was the church to do in their absence? To whom would they turn when they needed help? Though he would be outlived by the Apostle John, it was Paul who gave probably the clearest and mo most detailed explanation of how the church was to handle the departure of, and by extension, uh, the departure of the apostles, and by extension, his own departure, uh, in the book of 2 Timothy. Now, just a bit of background. 2 Timothy is the last canonical letter that is written by Paul. According to early church tradition, he wrote it during his second imprisonment in Rome. Uh, the book of Acts closes with his first imprisonment, when he's waiting under house arrest to have his case heard by Nero. Uh, Luke does not tell us how that ended, but tradition indicates that he won his appeal and he was set free. But when the persecution of Christians reached the imperial level just a few years later, uh, Paul was imprisoned again, and this time it resulted in his own death and probably the death of the apostle Peter as well. Paul's description of his circumstances in 2 Timothy is it's not morbid, but it is extremely serious. Everything that he writes to his young protege, Timothy, indicates that Paul knows that his number is up, his time has come, his race is about to finish. Now, the one to whom Paul was writing would have felt this loss particularly. Timothy was trusted by Paul a great deal. They had known each other for some time. Timothy was well, very well trusted by the apostle, even though Timothy seems to have been prone to timidity and fearfulness. Uh, we know that because Paul has to keep telling him to be of good courage uh, and to be strong and to be courageous. He doesn't say that to Titus. Why doesn't he say it to Titus? Because Titus didn't need to hear it. He was already that. Timothy needed to hear it. And uh, despite that timidity, Paul kept sending Timothy to really, really tough spots. Uh, and where he was at this point was not exactly the easiest place to be, the church in Ephesus. Timothy was serving as Paul's apostolic representative to the church there in Ephesus, where Paul had spent considerable time himself planting and watering the gospel work. Now, for us to understand what's going on in verses 13 and 14, we need to just remember what Paul has talked about thus far. He's introduced himself. He has thanked God for Timothy and for his faith, but he reminds him to fan into flame the gift of God that had been imparted to him at what seems to have been the setting apart of Timothy for ministry. Paul reminds Timothy that God had not given him a spirit of fear, but love and power and sound mind. And because of that, Timothy did not need to be ashamed of Paul or the gospel for which Paul was suffering. Now, Paul expresses supreme confidence then in God who is able to retain the deposit that is entrusted to him. And with that, Paul then gives Timothy two commands in verses 13 and 14. Plain and simple. Verse 13 is the first command. If you're keeping score at home, this first command is simply keep the pattern. Verse 13, what you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching. Now, what was it exactly that Timothy had heard from Paul? Uh, when we look back at verses 8 through 12, we get a kind of summary of it. Uh, again, Paul uh, says to Timothy in verses 8 through 12, So do not be ashamed of the testimony of, about our Lord or of me as prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And then he goes on and gives a kind of summary statement of it. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. 
but has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. This would not have been the entirety of everything that Paul had ever told Timothy ever. Uh, otherwise, their relationship would have been either extremely repetitive or very brief. Uh, but what Paul is doing is giving, as I said, a kind of summary statement of the gospel that he and his fellow apostles had preached. Uh, there's actually a lot here. Even though there are not many words in verses about 8 through 12, there's a lot that Paul describes. He talks about God's grace. He gives a kind of basic Christology, uh, both pre-existent and historical, and then gives a kind of outline of salvation. Paul also says that the reason that he is suffering is because of this message. And so this isn't simply an academic matter for Paul. This is something for which he is undergoing uh, way worse imprisonment than he had the first time. First time he's under house arrest. He can't go anywhere, but it's still fair, not, well, it's not the least uncomfortable, or it's not the most uncomfortable thing that you can endure. This is worse. This is the Mamertine prison. This is not a good situation for anyone to be in. He is isolated. And yet, Paul says, in keeping the proper perspective on everything, it's for this gospel that I am suffering, and you do not need to be ashamed. And he continues to express confidence in God. Now, Paul's command to Timothy when it comes to this message and the way that he had exposited it to him over time, Paul's instruction to Timothy when it comes to this message is keep it as a pattern of sound teaching. Now we can see pretty, pretty quickly on a, on a quick reading of this that Paul is telling Timothy to hold on to the gospel that he had heard from him and that he had summarized just a few verses prior. When we take a step back though, we can see that there's a lot more at work here. The term that Paul uses for a pattern connotes a, a model, a form, or a standard that is intended to function as a trustworthy guide. Timothy needed to hold fast to the content of that gospel as communicated by Paul as a kind of measuring rod so that he could know what was sound and what was not. It is implied, I think, as well, that Timothy is to use the kinds of words and phrases that Paul uses and to hold on to them and not merely to hold on to the concepts alone. Uh, that idea might sound a little bit abstract, but a good picture of this would be something like uh, if someone came through if someone came through and they were preaching and they they said that the Trinity was a load of nonsense now even a fairly new Christian even a very new Christian who's never read Athanasius or the Cappadocian Fathers or any of or Augustine's on the Trinity even they're gonna know that uh, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound right. It doesn't pass the smell test, with all apologies for the mixed metaphor. They're going to know that something's just not lining up. Because over time, we have a kind of standard vocabulary that we use for expressing the truth of Scripture. It's tried and true language that has been used for centuries. And if someone comes along denying it, there's almost certainly something amiss. Not always, but it, it does, it, it should at least put the desire in you to keep your hand on your wallet, at least. Yeah, just, okay, what else is going on here? Uh, all of this would have been of immediate importance for Timothy. This is in, these are instructions he needed to know right then. Uh, because there were threats to the gospel in Ephesus. Paul had actually been warning the Ephesians about this sort of thing for years in Acts 20, as he was on his way to Rome for his first imprisonment, Paul warned the Ephesian elders, pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. 
I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. So Paul knew that there was going to be some kind of a problem, and he even foresaw that some of the problems would come from unreliable leadership. And Timothy, his trusted representative, and potentially the only one that he knew he could rely on, or at least one of the few that he knew that he could rely on in Ephesus, he's, he's only maintaining a set of warnings that he's already given, and he's reinforcing them. Uh, in both First and Second Timothy, there are frequent references to false teaching, to the false teaching that he appears to have foreseen in Acts, and he even refers uh, at times to specific individuals who had forsaken the gospel and who were spreading this heresy, and everything that Paul states seems to indicate that it was widespread. Now, as to what was being said, he doesn't say. He doesn't have to. Timothy already knew what it was. It didn't require any mental gymnastics uh, because all he had to do seemingly was stick his head out the window and he would, come, uh, he would come into contact with it. Paul describes it in a few ways. He calls it irreverent babble uh, and warns Timothy that it would lead people into more and more ungodliness. Uh, at one point in chapter 2, he terms it, foolish, ignorant controversies and states that they breed quarrels. And Paul seems to have thought that more of this was to come because he says in chapter 4, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions that will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So we don't know exactly what it was that Timothy was dealing with. What we do know is that Paul has given Timothy a standard that he is to use. He has given him a theological yardstick by which he is to measure the teaching that is sort of proliferating around Ephesus, and he's to use that to curtail that false teaching insofar as he had the ability. Um, in spite of this threat that Paul seems to have known was coming uh, and, have, and have been trying to prepare the Ephesians for, he does say in verse 12, yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Uh, the gospel had been entrusted to Paul. It was being threatened, but he was confident that Jesus was going to continue to safeguard that message through his care for the church as the great shepherd of the sheep. I, and so it, it, it's for this that we need to read chapter, or chapter 1, verse 13, with a great deal of gravity. When Paul tells Timothy to retain the pattern of sound words, he is calling on him to not just remain faithful to a human teacher. He's telling him, stick with the message that I got from God. Don't mess with it, and anything else that comes short, you need to refute it. Now that, to modern ears, that might sound a little, I'm trying to think of the right word, cranky, <laughs> uh, or at least might inspire one to be that, uh, but what does Paul, how does Paul tell Timothy to, to do this? How does he tell him to keep this pattern? Well, at the end of verse 13, he says that he is to do it in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Uh, these two work together much more than I think we realize. Timothy was to retain the pattern of faith in Christ, which meant that he was con to continue to trusting in the source of the gospel, who would end up doing a much better job of maintaining it anyway. Paul, as he expressed in verse 12, had supreme confidence in his Lord's ability to guard the gospel that he himself had delivered to the apostle. And so Paul is urging Timothy in telling him to do this in faith, he's urging Timothy to do the same. Only that kind of trust would allow Timothy to do this in love. Because Timothy would know that ultimately it was not up to him. He was not the last line of defense. He had responsibilities, 
but it was not in his own ability to do this. It was not in his own strength. Uh, Paul elsewhere in, these letter, in this letter tells Timothy to leave the possibility open that some who had been deceived by these heretics would actually be brought back to the faith. He says in chapter 2, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. So if Timothy was anxious about the threats to the gospel and did not trust his sovereign Lord to safeguard his own message, there really wasn't going to be any way for Timothy to do it in a loving manner because he was going to be given constantly to worry, to anxiety, to fear. But if he did it in trust, he would be able to do it in love and even joy, which sounds impossible to us. That doesn't sound conceivable. However, with God, all things are possible, including holding fast to the gospel that is being threatened from within and without. And so Paul urges Timothy in verse 14, this is the second command, guard the good deposit. Now I'm going to read it, not backwards, but I'm going to take the second clause first because it comes first the way that, that Paul wrote it. Uh, and hopefully you'll see why I'm doing it this way. I don't normally take things out of order, but there is a reason. Uh, the command here is guard the good deposit entrusted to you. I, I remember, I think, when was this? 2012. I remember my, my former uh, pastor and advisor, Carl Truman, uh, at, a, at a pastor's conference. He was giving a kind of breakout talk on the Reformation. It was entitled, Why the Reformation Isn't Over. Uh, and in this provocatively titled breakout session, he said at the end, uh, in another very provocative final point, he said that the Reformation shows us that you need more than the gospel to protect the gospel. Now here, here was the substance of his point. What the reformers learned within a few years of the Reformation was that they were going to need to train ministers and create structures and institutions that would preserve the faith that they had sacrificed so much to recover. Timothy is learning a very similar lesson here. If the false teaching in Ephesus is to be curtailed and if the true faith is to be proclaimed, Timothy must not only guard the good deposit himself by teaching it properly and refuting those who do not, but he also must take what he has learned and entrust it to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others also. Timothy and the other elders in Ephesus were one day going to, going to pass off the scene, and they needed to leave the church in good hands for those who would follow them. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that I was going to take this verse out of order, and here's why. Because when we hear things like that, when we hear commands like that, guard the good deposit, do it by entrusting it to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, that seems overwhelming. But how is it that Paul tells Timothy to do it? He says, do this by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Both Paul and Timothy had the Holy Spirit indwelling them, and this matches what Paul said in Philippians 2, 12, and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Timothy could not only rely on Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, to guard his flock, even when Timothy could not, humanly speaking. He could also be assured that the same spirit who had inspired Paul to write this message and who had inspired the other writers of the New Testament and the writers of the Old Testament to give the good deposit that Timothy was to guard, Timothy 
could rest in knowing that that same spirit would then give him the strength and the courage and the fortitude and the joy and the love necessary to guard that same deposit and to entrust it to others. So how do we apply this? Uh, the, uh, the line between theft and good scholarship uh, is very thin. It's actually a footnote. Uh, and so I will, uh, when I crib illustrations from other people, I will tell you where I got them. Uh, and this one also comes from Carl Truman uh, that he used quite a bit, both in, in the pulpit and in the classroom. Uh, he saw once an advertisement for, actually he had seen it several times, but it caught his attention, uh, an advertisement for a line of Swiss watches called Patek Philippe. Now these are obscenely expensive. You don't buy them in a store, you buy them in a salon. So you, you, know, you kind of know that it's, it's the mortgage or the watch. Uh, for all of this expenditure though, and grandiosity, uh, their tagline is extremely appropriate. Uh, 20 years ago, their advertising campaign, their slogan was this, you never actually own a Patek Philippe. You merely look, look after it for the next generation. The application to the message that we proclaim and the church to which we belong is obvious. We never actually own this church or the gospel. We merely look after it for the next generation. That is a humbling task. And most of us can think of churches that did not make it. Some of you come from bodies that either redefined or eliminated the gospel, or even uh, perhaps they said that they believed it, but they minimized it to the point that you really would have to dig down pretty hard to actually find it. And they did that thinking that by trimming their sails to catch the winds of current sentiments, it would take them to the prosperous shores of relevance. But instead, they were only shipwrecked on the rocks of obsolescence. That's a little more poetic than I normally am, but it, it, it came naturally. I myself, this is a little bit more my speed, I myself have seen what I thought were sound congregations turn into the ecclesiastical version of dumpster fires and the wreck and the ruin and the pain that those bodies wreaked on those that had been entrusted to their charge. That pain continues to this day. Uh, when we were founded in 1901, the fundamentalist modernist controversy was, it, it was still on the horizon. We were still about about 15 years off from it, really, really getting speed. But there were rumblings about the dangers of fire criticism. Uh, those came to a head in the Northern Baptist Convention in the 1920s. Uh, and the subsequent attempts to write the denomination failed, leading to the formation of the Conservative Baptist Association in 1947, to which we belong. In God's kindness, we were not swept up into the, liberal, into the kind of liberalism that was rampant in Northern Baptist seminaries in those days. When our denomination, the Northern Baptist Convention, was started in 1907, there were no conservative seminaries with which we were affiliated, none. They were all in horrendous shape. But in God's kindness, we did not succumb to that, not because we're special or because there's anything amazing about us, uh, simply in his kindness, he preserved us from that. We have been preserved from the theological pathogens that have infected so many other institutions over the last few decades. But past providence is not a guarantee of future deliverance. There's a lot on the horizon uh, from the chaos relating to sex and identity uh, to the hostility toward any kind of outside authority or tradition or history. And this was long before statues started to topple. This has been something 50 years in the making, and the chickens are finally coming home to roost. These are not times for optimism. 
but they are times for hope. We can't know the future, but what we can do is to do what we can to ensure that the work that was done 120 years ago and that was maintained over the last half century by two faithful servants will remain viable. What is the answer? What can we do? Well, th this is going to sound very simplistic, but the answer is the same as it was two millennia ago when Paul wrote to Timothy. We keep the pattern of sound words that we received, and we entrust the task of defending that message primarily, though not exclusively, everybody's got a hand in this, to reliable men who can teach others also. It isn't enough, though, to have a doctrinal standard, though all churches should have a good one. It is not enough to have clear procedures and coherent policies, though those are necessary too. Personnel is policy. And so we need good men to guard the good deposit. In the end, men are better than gates. And so if you're going to defend it, you need the right people. We have good elders already. And not every church can say that. But we do. We are blessed here. The elders that I serve with are good men. But we have a big job to do, and for this we covet your prayers. We trust that in God's goodness, he will, by his spirit, give us the strength to guard this good deposit. So that in 120 years, should the Lord tarry, our descendants will be recounting the quiet stewardship of those who came before. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we ask that in our time that we would be found faithful. We thank you for the labors of those who have come before, for those who have tarried long in your word so that they might deliver it well, that they might feed the flock that has been apportioned to their charge. And we ask that for us as a congregation, as we uh, continue to step forward, but the latest in a long line of what we trust will be good stewards of the faith, we ask that by the same spirit who inspired this word, that we would have the strength to do it. And we do so in faith and love, knowing that that which we have entrusted to you, Lord Jesus, you will keep until that day. Heavenly Father, draw many to yourself through the preaching of your word, not for our glory, but for yours. All of, things, all of these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. Amen. Our Lord is going to send us forth the word of blessing. This comes from Jude 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. You're dismissed.